Hello, and thank you for joining us for the End Stage Renal Disease National Coordinating Center podcast. My name is Jerome Bailey, and I'm the Associate Director of Patient and Family Engagement with the ESRD NCC. We partner with patients, healthcare providers, and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also known as CMS, to create and share resources that help kidney patients improve their quality of life. On today's podcast, we are discussing how to keep patients safe and healthy inside and outside of the dialysis unit. We'll explore infection prevention, the importance of understanding lab results, tips to help patients follow a kidney-friendly diet, and more. To help us examine these topics, I'm joined by Sheila McMaster, a registered nurse and the Quality Improvement Director for ESRD Network 8, and Lacey Smalley, a registered dietitian for Fresenius Kidney Care in West Louisiana. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having us, Jerome. So, let's start the conversation with Sheila. What are some of the common infections seen in dialysis patients? Well, Jerome, dialysis patients are similar to non-dialysis patients in that they have routine infections such as colds, um, bronchitis, that sort of respiratory infections. But there is a somewhat higher risk of contracting bacterial infections such as urinary tract infections and pneumonia. Dialysis patients may also experience serious infections related to the dialysis access. For hemodialysis patients, an arteriovenous fistula has the lowest likelihood of infection, while a dialysis catheter carries the highest risk of infection. For most patients, it's better to think of a dialysis catheter as a temporary access only, sort of like a spare tire. A catheter will work, not always really great, but it really isn't meant for long-term use for most patients. Once a permanent access, either a fistula or a graft can be used, the catheter can be removed and infection likelihood can decrease. For peritoneal patients, there's a risk of peritoneal dialysis catheter exit site infection, tunnel infection, and or peritonitis. Sheila, who determines what type of access a patient receives? Great question. Generally, that's a conversation that needs to be held between the patient and the, the care team. Uh, nephrologists usually strongly suggest permanent accesses such as a fistula or a graft for patients who are able to maintain those accesses. There are some patients who can't have a working fistula or graft for physical reasons, but generally the nephrologist kind of captains the ship and then in consultation with a surgeon, the best access is chosen. So how can infection be prevented? Another good question. Dialysis staff spend a huge amount of time teaching patients about strategies to avoid these infections. Simple, proven strategies such as hand washing, vaccinations for flu, pneumonia, hepatitis, shingles, or even chicken pox. Um, they also discuss access type and teach patients about the lowest risk access. They teach patients about proper arm cleaning prior to needle insertion for patients who have a fistula or a graft. And they also teach patients signs and symptoms of infection that need to be reported when they occur, such as fever, chills, redness, tenderness, or drainage at the access site, um, abdominal pain or cloudy dialysis fluid for peritoneal patients. For patients that are medically unable to have a fistula or graft and must rely on a catheter, we really want these patients and their family members to be superstars in infection control. This generally means keeping that catheter dressing in place and dry. Of course, right now we're 
We want all patients following CDC guidance for hand washing or hand sanitizer use, wearing masks and physical distancing to minimize the spread of COVID-19. Lacey, what is a dietitian and what role does this person play as part of the, a patient's uh, healthcare team? Um, so a dietitian is an expert in nutrition. In the dialysis setting, the dietitian is someone who specializes in nutrition for the renal population. Um, the role of the dietitian is to help, you know, improve the patient's overall quality of life by improving their nutritional status. Dietitians in the dialysis setting provide the patients with nutrition education, and we provide the patients with the tools and resources that they need um, to help improve their nutrition. So, how can a registered dietitian help a patient understand uh, lab results? So, when the dietitian reviews lab results with the patient, we explain how the patient's diet can affect those lab results, and then help the patient to make diet changes to improve those labs. We also help the patient to understand um, how those lab results can affect the patient's just overall health in general. So are there any particular lab results that patients should be paying close attention to? Yes. So the first one um, would be albumin, and albumin is a measure of the protein in blood. Albumin is extremely important to help fight infection, and it aids in healing. So it's very important for the patients to eat plenty of protein, so eggs, fresh chicken, um, fish, um, lean beef. Another lab that's important is potassium, and potassium is a mineral that's needed for normal heart and muscle function, but too much potassium um, could actually cause the heart to stop. So there are also foods that are high in potassium that the patient must avoid, things like orange juice, um, oranges, bananas, potatoes, tomatoes. Um, Another lab is phosphorus, and um, having an elevated phosphorus over time could lead to bone or heart disease. So there are also foods that are high in phosphorus that the patient must avoid. Things like dark sodas, um, excessive amounts of dairy, um, fast food and junk foods, um, those type of foods. Um, another thing that's not necessarily a lab, but it's very important that the patients watch their salt intake because Salt not only increases blood pressure, but it makes the patient thirsty, which could lead to fluid overload. How can following a kidney diet help dialysis patients? Following the diet can really just improve the patient's overall quality of life. Um, it, it can help them to feel better. Having good labs can help the patient feel better. Um, following the diet could also help to prevent further health complications and um, reduce the risk of hospitalization. What happens if a patient chooses to miss or skip a dialysis treatment? If they miss or skip, they could um, begin to retain fluid, which would cause them to have trouble breathing. Um, the extra fluid is hard on the heart. It causes the heart to work overtime. Um, the buildup of toxins in the blood could cause the patient to lose their appetite. They could become, you know, they could develop nausea and vomiting. Um, I mentioned potassium earlier. Potassium could become elevated, which could cause the patient to feel very bad. And like I said, in extreme instances, could even cause the heart to stop. Those are great points, Lacey. And I would just add that missing dialysis may mean missing important medicines that are normally given during dialysis. And everyone knows that life happens and there are times when a patient simply can't make a scheduled appointment. And the key when that happens is to talk with the clinic about this and reschedule the treatment, not just skip it. We don't want patients to have those consequences of shortness of breath or high potassium levels or high blood pressures or missed medicine. What advice would you give a dialysis patient struggling to follow his or her healthcare team's advice? This is Sheila, and I would say one word, communicate. 
patients need to be an active part of the healthcare team. They are the quarterback. They need to work with everyone on the team. They need to ask questions. Generally, if we understand the why behind the advice that is given, it helps us to avoid learning lessons the hard way. So I would say communicate. Yeah, I agree with Sheila. Having those open conversations with their dialysis staff, we are here to help. The dietitian, the social worker, the nurse, we are all here for that patient. Um, I would also suggest that they find support in a family member or a friend, um, someone that, you know, that helps to encourage the patient, that helps keep them on track, maybe someone to help with grocery shopping or, or just, you know, checking in with the patient daily um, just for that encouragement. Sheila, Lacey, it's been a pleasure to speak with you today. We are grateful for your time and dedication to improving the quality and experience of care for all of those touched by dialysis. Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. We thank you for listening to this podcast. To listen to the rest of our podcast series on kidney transplantation or home dialysis, or to learn more about kidney failure, visit the in-stage renal disease National Coordinating Center website at www.esrdncc.org or talk to your healthcare provider. Thank you.